Welcome to the dark stream, Vox Day, voxday.blogspot.com, and unauthorized.tv. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I hope you can hear this. Do I even have my, yeah, it looks like I have my mic on. So we should be good. Anyhow, it's uh, getting interesting, isn't it? One might even say it's getting intriguing. Um, I don't know about you, but I am uh, following events with a great deal of interest. And, you know, you may recall that uh, I said that I was previously 85% uh, convinced that the God Emperor of the United States was going to cross the Rubicon. And then I, I raised that percentage to 88%. Um, now I would say I'm probably at 92% uh, convinced that we're going to see some historic events in the next five days, uh, quite possibly in the next two days. So some of you have been alluding to what we've all seen, uh, the, the fortification and militarization of DC, the District of Columbia. And you know, this is what I was thinking about. So I was in Rome uh, about 15 years ago and I picked up this book. Le Grandi Battaglie di Roma Antica, Dalle Guerre Saniche alle Invasioni Barbariche, i Combattimenti e gli Scontri che hanno avuto per protagonista la Città, la città Eterna. La Città Eterna. Um, forgive my pronunciation, I'm tired. But what's interesting is have a look at this uh, page 88. It's, of course, the Battle of Cannae. And if you look at the bottom image, you can see that that's what it looked like after the Roman cavalry was driven off. The Roman infantry had, in, in thinking it was driving back the Carthaginian center, managed to get itself fully enveloped fully surrounded and uh, ultimately destroyed. The Battle of Cannae, uh, we've talked about it before, uh, that particular uh, highly unusual tactic is called a double envelopment. Now, what I think is fascinating is, as I pointed out previously, for a double envelopment to succeed, it's going to be necessary for the enemy to believe they're winning. They have to believe they're winning. If they don't believe they're winning, they won't put themselves in a position to be surrounded and destroyed. And so imagine if you were a Roman infantryman, a legionary at Cannae and at first, you just see the troops being driven back, the enemy troops being pushed back. And then you suddenly see off to one side, there's some dust clouds and stuff. You can see there's something going on over there, but you can't, but you can't um, tell what it is. And then you look on the other side and you can't tell what it is. And then gradually, you suddenly realize that 
the soldiers on either side of you are getting pushed closer and closer together. There was, there's going to be a point where you suddenly begin to realize that you might not be winning. You might not be uh, in a position that you can even extricate yourself from. And so I think that the uh, would-be uh, Biden administration is now in that position. Now keep in mind, I have no secret channels. I have no direct information from anybody. Uh, I have no information that any of you can't access. Okay, granted, I'm probably uh, a lot more intelligent, I'm definitely better read, and I probably have better pattern recognition skills than you do. But I don't actually know anything that you don't. And so when you look at the, the situation, it's easy to recognize that the Biden camp is suddenly getting very, very nervous about what's happening. We're not talking about the, the fear of Nancy Pelosi. Okay, we're not talking about that sort of thing. We're not talking about uh, AOC being terrified that the Capitol stormers were going to uh, harm her in some way. What we're talking about is that dawning horror upon realizing that they are caught in a trap. And so when you look at the reason that Biden canceled the uh, rehearsal for the inauguration today, or uh, they canceled it for Sunday, and there's some question now about whether they are going to um, even do the rehearsal on Monday as it's been rescheduled. Why? Because they're beginning to worry that the mainstream narrative isn't true. Now, somebody asked earlier, and hold off on super chats and all that sort of thing, but somebody asked earlier in the chat, they said, well, if everyone is, is telling them this, well, why don't they realize it? Well, you need to keep in mind that Camp Biden doesn't pay any attention whatsoever to anything that people like me say. Just look at the, some of the comments here from the, you know, from the various lefties and trolls and stuff that, that pay limited attention uh, to this channel. Your patterns is hallucinetic as fuck. Um, someone else said that, uh, let's see, they, um, you know, it's just copium, hopium right? Uh, so even when they're told, even when they're informed about what appears to be happening, what appears to be taking place, they deny it. So they're not hearing this stuff for the most part. And those of them, you know, the low level flunky, you know, nobody media people who might be paying a little bit of attention are just flat out don't believe anything that we say. And so uh, the political class pays very, very close attention to the media. And the media, of course, is sticking religiously to whatever the media narrative is. And so the media narrative is that, well, uh, this unprecedented show of military force at the Capitol is to protect against those terrible right-wing Capitol stormers who are 
going to come back and might possibly uh, cause a ruckus at the uh, at the inauguration. Uh, so they don't believe. They flat out don't believe. Remember, people always miscalculate. In, in every war, it's usually quite common for both sides to believe that they have the ability to win. In retrospect, people look at their thinking, their respective thinking, and they realize which side was clearly smoking crack. If you look at the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, that looks insane. You know, the Japanese never had the fuel reserves, they never had the industrial capacity, they never had the ocean transport, they never had the air cover to even think about invading Hawaii, let alone California. Now, of course, they didn't actually plan to invade it. The whole idea for them was just to hit the uh, U.S. in the face and, and give them a bloody nose and convince them to leave them alone, which, of course, was also stupid. But the point is, is that they miscalculated. The Germans did the same thing when they attacked the Soviet Union and opened up a two-front war. And so it's very, very common. It is normal um, for one side to miscalculate, both in terms of their respective strength as well as what the enemy is going to do. Okay, and so it shouldn't surprise you that the Democrats and the corrupt Republicans completely overestimate their position. Why wouldn't they? They control the media, they control the courts, they control the legislatures, and they think they have enough control over the military, although they're not entirely certain. Which, of course, is what Nancy Pelosi was attempting to do in the last week. Um, any examples of a Trump miscalculation? Um, not off the top of my head, but you know, he Trump is an expert at encouraging people to underestimate him. I went on Chinese state television, their English channel, and told two very, very dubious economists, as well as the, the host, who was much more polite, but uh, probably equally dubious. Um, he was, uh, all three of them, found it very hard to believe that Trump was going to start a trade war with China. I said, not only are they going to, not only is President Trump going to start it, he is going to win it. I said, in fact, he can't possibly lose it. And so they had me on a, f um, a few weeks later because I was correct. You know, the Chinese government, the Chinese media completely underestimated him. And I strongly suspect that that's exactly what's taking place now. You know, Donald Trump hasn't conceded in the slightest. All of the placatory comments that he's made are just meant to avoid alarming his enemies before they move into the trap. That's what I think. Every single thing that I've seen over the last 10 days 
convinces me that this is what is taking place. You know, the, I mean, remember, if you want to perform a double envelopment, they have to be convinced, the enemy has to be convinced that it's winning. Otherwise, they don't enter the trap. Why can't I find that? Anyhow, you saw it. Uh, oh, the second pin of war. There we go. Okay. Again, if you're going to get your enemy to get in, go into the trap, the one on the bottom, you've got to convince them that they're winning. Look at how the black, it's the black uh, semicircle in the middle. Look at how they actually uh, extended it initially in order to emphasize and exaggerate the amount that they'd fallen back. That was obviously intentional in retrospect. But if you don't convince the enemy that they're going to win, then they're not going to enter it. Uh, what does the trap entail? Well, we're told many different things, but uh, you know, I personally think that the the Q narrative is um, generally true. It's full of misinformation. It's full of disinformation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, I mean, think about this. What other explanation do you have for? 21,000, possibly as many as 25,000 troops in Washington, D.C. What other explanation do you have for all of the travel in and out of the city being blocked off? The air travels, the, the, the air uh, travel to Europe is being severely restricted. You know, a lot of you probably don't know much about, um, uh, about what's going on in Europe. Multiple governments are falling. Uh, there's massive arrests taking place in Italy. Uh, Britain just announced that they were uh, putting severe restrictions on any entry into the UK. If you put all of these things together, it becomes extremely obvious that there is a military action taking place, a very large scale military action taking place. And something that you need to remember is that whenever there is a military action, there's always a period of preparation where the troops are moved into place. And the whole point of it the whole point of the of the announcements surrounding it and the excuses for it are always false. They're always false in order to, um, you know, in order to prevent the uh, you know, people from accepting what they're seeing. You know, obviously the Biden camp is concerned about it because that's why they're very concerned about going into Washington DC and holding even a rehearsal for the inauguration. Now let's address some of these points that, that people have been uh, side points. Uh, perhaps the Q pacification was intended to keep the more kinetic elements of the heritage wing at bay. Um, well, first of all, uh, no, that's not the point of the Q PSYOP. The point of the Q PSYOP was to, number one, maintain morale, uh, which, uh, well, actually it's three things. Number one, to encourage people to stop believing the media narrative. It was very, very successful in doing that. You know, regardless, of what you think about Q, the one thing it accomplished above all else is to convince people 
that the media narrative was false, that the media was lying to the American people. The second thing that it managed to convince quite a few people is that there was an evil elite, right? The third point was to keep up morale. You know, the whole, the whole idea of informing people and letting people know what was happening, that wasn't the point. It was never the point. You know, it's given us some idea, all the, the, the red lines uh, that are indicated are um, potentially useful. It, it gives us context in which to interpret the events that we're witnessing. Um, but see, this Ryan Thompson's idea is, is uh, ridiculous, uh, that it's planted by the deep state to de derail the truther movement. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. The, the dumbest idea, the absolute dumbest idea, is this, uh, is, is the idea that um, getting people to trust the plan would keep them from taking action themselves. That's ridiculous. No Americans were even thinking of taking any action at all throughout the last four years. You know, it's, it's totally ridiculous. And notice that they're still trying to poison that narrative. What's, can anyone tell me what the latest uh, false anti-Q narrative is? Have any of you identified that? I, uh, I just noticed it two days ago, and I've already seen about 10 or 12 references to this new anti-Q theory. And it made me laugh because the first time I, I saw it, I thought, hmm, maybe this, I wonder if this is, is yet another false narrative. There we go. Molten Cheese Bear got it. The Bolshevik Q precursor story. Exactly. That is one of the dumbest uh, shills I've ever seen. You know, the idea that um, the, the idea that the uh, uh, the whole thing it was somehow a, a a secret Bolshevist act. I mean, it it just it doesn't even make any sense, none whatsoever, and. Um, no, see, Boo Dog, that's that's stupid. He says Q is obvious cloak and dagger nonsense. No, it's not. First of all, and that lowers morale. Obviously, see, th th look, this is why it's sometimes hard for me to pay any attention to questions from people because you really, really need to think about what you're saying. Okay, I I, I don't I don't mean. To, to sound arrogant in this regard, and I don't mean to sound contemptuous, but honestly, it, it's sometimes helpful to keep in mind that normal people literally sound to me the way that retarded people, and I mean severely retarded people, sound to the normal person. Okay? Let, let's just take this particular idea. Well, because it's cryptic, that lowers morale. Okay, what you're ignoring there is you're ignoring the enthusiasm and the explosion of merchandise and the excitement that has surrounded the Q phenomenon. It's actually called a phenomenon by the media. No, Buddha, you said, what you said sounded to me like you were drooling and going, I mean, that's how dumb it sounded. You literally didn't pay any attention whatsoever to anything about the consequences of people's morale. And yet you made a comment about it. Don't do that. That's incredibly stupid. Okay? So... <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling that we're going to be 
I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing a lot of that that video clip. <laughs> Anyhow, um, the point isn't whether you know Q is the new oracle of Delphi. It's not. It's not something that you should take literally all the time. But to say something is obviously and totally false. To claim that it lowered morale is bordering on insane. It, it, it has no relevance whatsoever to everything that we've seen over the past three years. And so, you know, and <laughs> you can think I'm wrong. You know, you, you it's fine that you, um, it, it's, it's fine that you think that Biden is going to be sworn in and the National Guard troops are just there for the inauguration and then they're all going to go home with nothing going on, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I disagree, but um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, keep in mind, everybody told me that Brexit was going to fail. When I started telling people back in 2002 that there was a problem with the housing market, and then I told them in 2008 that the problem with the housing market was now spreading to the financial industry and there was going to be a crash, you can look all this stuff up, I was correct. You know, I actually got offered jobs by uh, investment banks and financial firms because they wanted me to work for them, uh, you know, analyzing the markets. I, I, looked, I looked into it a little bit and just decided I didn't want to do that. But, um, you know, I told you, I told you that Trump was going to win in 2016. I told you that he won in a landslide in 2020. I still believe he did. Um, so is it possible that, that, that I'm wrong? I, I said, I said directly, I'm 92% convinced of what I'm telling you. It's of course it's possible that I'm wrong. No, see, John, you're, you're absolutely, <laughs> John McClellan, smart people don't brag about being smart. I'm not bragging, John. You're literally retarded compared to me. Numerically, the math will tell you that. It's not bragging. It's a simple fact. You know, <laughs> insecure people like to try to claim that secure people can't be secure because of some weird rule that they invent that makes them feel better. That, my friends, is copium. You know, if I'm wrong, you guys will have plenty of opportunity to give me a hard time about it. I've been wrong before. You know, I genuinely thought that Hillary Clinton was going to be the nominee in 2008. I was wrong. Obama somehow managed to snake it from her. You know, turned out, I don't know if you, if you, some of you knew this, is that um, Hillary's campaign manager didn't know the rules. He literally didn't know the rules. And so, um, yeah, that was why she lost. She, you know, she should have won. She could have won. I don't know if she was secretly sabotaged somehow or if, you know, she was just so confident that it was her turn that she screwed it up. But, um, you know, but I was absolutely wrong about that. Not a problem. Um, but yeah, so we'll see what happens. You know, uh, if I happen to be uh, incorrect, plenty of people are going to really enjoy reminding me of that for a long time. Fine. <laughs> I'm not concerned at all. All I do here is I pay attention. 
I observe, and then I, uh, you know, and then I simply tell you what I'm thinking. And the funny thing is that what I know from past experience is that all of you who are telling me that I'm wrong are not going to come back here to tell me that I was right. So, um, I don't care, you know, in, in, in case it's not clear, I couldn't care less what anybody thinks. If I did, I would find it hard to, you know, simply say what I think and take the heat when I'm wrong. So, um, what was the, how could you could have won? Um, they constructed their whole strategy around winning California and they didn't realize, the campaign manager didn't realize that they had changed the rules from the previous campaign or the previous election round, primary round, and California was no longer valuable enough in, you know, it couldn't make up for the earlier states. And so, um, there was a, a rather famous interview, it might have been with Politico or something, and it was kind of funny because the guy, the, the reporter who wrote the article clearly realized as he was interviewing the campaign manager that as the campaign manager was talking about their strategy, he clearly realized that it didn't work. It wasn't going to work. So it was really funny. Um, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> yeah, strangely enough, the can that's why I kind of wonder about about the whole thing because apparently the campaign manager was not found uh, dead in a park of suicide with three shots in his of uh, you know three thirty eight revolver uh, bullets in his in his back, um, but uh, but yeah. So anyhow. Um, so we'll just have to we'll just have to wait and see. Um, Merkwood says, "What do you expect to happen to Darkstream's popularity after the election crisis?" I don't know. I frankly don't care. Um, I don't know how much longer uh, we'll be on YouTube. Nobody knows how long they'll be on YouTube because YouTube is, uh, you know, constantly um, going after people, deplatforming people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean. Once we have live streaming uh, going on unauthorized, we'll probably do most of our uh, live streaming there. And so, um, uh, I really need to tell Slap Weasel and I'm going to stream, don't I? Um, <laughs> I mean, I think it should be pretty obvious that uh, I'm not this is not my medium. You know, my favorite medium is literary. You know, I'm, I would think that I'm rather better at writing books than I am at video, but, um, let's get rid of some of the, hang on. I have to, apparently I have to do a little moderating here. So, um, I mean, uh, one thing I never understand, I, I mean, personally, I don't watch a lot of videos, but what I really don't understand is like, watching videos <laughs> from, uh, by people that aren't interested in what the video is or who don't like the person who's who's doing the video. I mean, it's fine if you don't like what I'm saying or if you're not that interesting, interested in what I'm saying, or if you disagree with what I'm saying, but uh, it's just a little strange that you would uh, would waste your time on it. Uh, Hasn't Trump been ready to go all out since the day he spoke at Trump Tower? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that this is something that's been in the making for a long, long time. And it's also obvious if you look at the executive orders from 2018 and 2019, the whole thing is uh, clearly set up. You know, this, the, whether you agree with the relevance of Q or not, there are clearly multiple plans. So 
even if you don't, that's why I say, if, even if you don't trust the plan, trust the president. And I'm very doubtful that uh, this hasn't been uh, anticipated all along. Why is he waiting for the last moment? Because that's usually the right time to do it. If you act too soon, then you don't know what the other side is going to do. I'll give you an example. The first time the, uh, when, you, when you're in a, a adverse legal situation, oftentimes you have to submit documents at the same time as the other party. So they're due at the same time, right? So what inexperienced lawyers do is they get the documents prepared with plenty of time and then they go ahead and they upload them into the system. Well, then they tend to be very surprised when they see the documents from the other side and they realize that the more experienced lawyers downloaded their documents from the court, read them, quickly analyzed what they had said, and then modified their own submission, thus giving them the advantage in that particular submission. Chris also says, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. Exactly. Yeah. If you don't give the other side a chance to respond, you increase your chance of winning. So, um, and it's fine that, that people can, uh, can, you know, have their opinion and disagree. This is, it's good that they don't agree. It's good that they don't believe. If, if people don't believe, if people watching the stream don't believe, then obviously all the people who matter don't believe either. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. And so, um, no, you're lost. See, this is the kind of stuff that I don't want. Vox has been unbelievable. No, I haven't been unbelievably wrong. You, how can I be wrong about something that hasn't happened? <laughs> I mean, it, you know, anyone who is trying to criticize in advance is lying. Because until something happens, we don't actually know. I mean, think about this. That we are in a what is functionally a, uh, a military situation. Okay. Who knew who was going to win the Falklands War? You probably would have bet on the British Navy, but nobody knows until it's over. You don't know who is going to be president on January 22nd, 2021, because it's not January 22nd yet, okay? This isn't that hard. It's not that difficult to understand. Just because you find it difficult to imagine the concept that something is going to happen that hasn't happened before, doesn't mean that it can't happen. Doesn't mean that it won't happen. So be patient. I'm the one who's willing to stand here and say what I think. Would you prefer it if I was like all the other cucks and conservatives who are afraid to tell you what they think because they're afraid they might lose their audience they're afraid they might lose credibility. I mean, if that's what you want, don't come here. If you want somebody who's going to just make little suggestions and speak cryptically and uh, do that Scott Adams thing where he says, A, 
and then later he says B, and then after the event, no matter what happens, he tells you that he's, he predicted it. I could do that. If I wanted to, if I believed that my credibility mattered at all, if I cared what any of you think, if I wanted to try to increase the number of subscribers on this channel, sure, maybe I would do that. But I'm just here to tell you what I think. And what I think is actually what I think. Am I always right? No. But you can look up on my blog. I have 17 years unvarnished track record. What I mean by unvarnished is when I'm wrong, I just leave it up there. You can see how wrong I am. You know, and you know, that's, that's how I do it. It's probably why I didn't survive uh, in the, you know, in the mainstream media very long. It just really wasn't for me. So, you know, but if you look at everything that's happening, I mean, I, I'm curious, okay, th this, this is a question for those of you who believe I'm fundamentally wrong. Tell me this question. What are the 21,000 troops in Washington, D.C. there for? I'm not asking anybody who agrees with me or even suspects that I might be probably correct. I just want to know, you know stop saying, you're wrong, copium, blah, blah, blah. Just answer the question. Now, I, I said don't answer it if you don't actually believe it. I want the answer I want the answer from the people who genuinely believe that the protesters are not there to ensure that Trump is still in charge. Okay, Hank says to prevent another incursion. That's the media narrative, I get it. No idea, no idea. Nobody knows. So <laughs> You can't even come up with a reason. You can't even come up with an alternative explanation. And you're denying the obvious one. I mean, I've, I'm actually finding this tremendously fascinating because I always wondered how on earth did the various uh, nations in World War One, in World War Two, do nothing when the Germans or the Austro-Hungarians had all of their troops being uh, brought by train, transported by train to the border. But now I understand, <laughs> you know, they just flat out didn't want to believe. And so, well, you know, Germany may have, uh, you know, Chancellor Hitler may have sent uh, four divisions to the bridge at the river that's the border between our, our country and theirs, but I'm sure it's fine. I mean, what would you, why wouldn't you send four divisions to the border? Look, soldiers are sent places. Soldiers are sent places in order to be used. That's what they do. You know, and the reason that the National Guard is being used is very, very simple. Uh, it's because of what the Marines did in Los Angeles. I was, uh, a friend of mine was telling me about uh, a situation in, in LA back during the, the Rodney King riots. And the National Guard were having trouble controlling the situation. So 
uh, some Marines were sent in and to support the police because the police were completely uh, you know, outnumbered and, and probably outgunned. And at one point, uh, the, the police asked the Marines to cover their movement. <laughs> and they were uh, extremely shocked and more than a little upset when the Marines opened fire with 50 caliber machine guns on the civilians who were, uh, you know, giving the police trouble. Because to the police, you know, cover means, you know, just point your guns and, and make some noise. To the Marines, cover means open up. And so uh, I, I strongly suspect that that's why we're looking at something that is somewhere between a military and a police action um, rather than a full bore military action. You know, the Marines are a little bit too good at killing people and breaking things to want to have uh, them be your primary force. Um, you know, as a general rule, police make terrible soldiers and soldiers make terrible policemen. The National Guard are the exact sort of force you would use if you're going to have some light military activity mixed with policing. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't believe that we're actually looking at a a, a red a red inauguration. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is going to be controlling the city, making sure that the deep state is not able to foment the kind of disruption that it foments everywhere there's a color revolution, and to arrest the various bad actors who we are probably going to be informed about in the relatively near future. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I saw the reports about the, the Ospreys. I mean, there are Marines there, but just because you have the Marines there doesn't mean that they're going to be the primary force utilized. You know, that's why, I mean, they could have, you know, they could have, because it's a federal uh, zone, they could have just as easily sent in the U.S. Army, but you know, that would be the problem. So, um, so you know, it, it's going to be very interesting to see what is happening, and uh, you know, if if you listen to people like uh, Simon Parks, that gives you one perspective that's much more on the on the Q spectrum. If you listen to people like uh, what's his name, Mike Adams, um, it's very different. Um, I think that there are probably going to be, uh, <laughs> I think there's probably going to be a lot of arrests. And I think that there is, I, I think that we're watching history evolve. We're, we're watching the, we're watching the kind of history that we normally only read about. You know, either way, this is going to be a fundamental change in the future direction of the United States, you know, and that's that's going to uh, that that's why we need to pay attention. That's why it's worth talking about this stuff. That's why it's worth you know, <laughs> risking one's public credibility and so forth. Like I said, just the, as soon as I saw Tom Hanks was going to be there, I, I burst out laughing. I mean. It, it, it's, it's very, very amusing if that would turn out to be the ultimate Q proof. But, you know, we just have to watch and hope and pray. Yeah, let, let, let's take a vote. I'll, I'll start taking Super Chats in a second here, but let's go ahead and take a vote. I'm just kind of curious. Uh, Chris Scheuer says, hey, Vox, thanks for working with Luciano Cuna. Uh, Luciano's great. 
and what we are doing with Super Prumo and Archaven, I think is going to blow people's minds in two months. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's really a pleasure working with them and I can't wait to introduce their stuff to the English market. Uh, T Greeny one says, uh, is very generous and says, Vox, I kind of feel the National Guard are a distraction. Used to be in the army and they tend to be poorly combat ready. I have trained with. They won't be a main force, but after the fact uses, strategically it is best. Well, yeah, the, I, I know they tend to be not terribly combat ready. That's kind of the point. You don't want combat. The point is to avoid combat. And that's why they have, that, that's why the numbers are so strong why they've sent such numbers there because they want to, uh, you know, there's a saying quantity is a quality of its own. The Panther was a better tank than the Sherman, but it doesn't matter if every time uh, there was a combat, there were five Shermans to the one Panther. Um, the, the fact that the National Guard are not as effective soldiers is actually probably what makes them ideal for this particular operation. Obviously, for primary targets, that's where the Marines would be used or, or the Special Forces. Um, let's see. You know, and also, the other big thing to remember is that disinformation and misinformation is always fundamental. Always. Nobody is going to tell you exactly what they're doing. In fact, they're going to mislead you intentionally. So, um, Sydney Powell said it's over. Sydney Powell's part is over. They tried the courts. That's over. The whole thing isn't over. The whole thing isn't over until either Joe Biden or Donald Trump are the commander in chief on January 22nd. 48 hours after the event, then we can actually say what we think is happening. Karen took the kids says, uh, think about the damage that Q has done to the belief in the mainstream media and government worldwide. If it's a deep state psyop, then they fucked up big time. Exactly. That's, that's my point. It, it's, you can't talk about Q without paying attention to the observable consequences. You just can't. Uh, Carolina Swamp Fox sends $20. Thank you. Uh, Larry Dynamite says, what would be the most reliable tool for one 70 year old to behead another 70 year old? Um, I would assume a chainsaw, but, um, but I'm not encouraged to have chainsaws. Um, apparently there's a, there's a, some doubt about my ability to, uh, avoid, avoid cutting something I shouldn't. Um, so let's take the vote. Okay. We've got, uh, 2,150 people here. So, uh, if you think that president Trump is going to cross the Rubicon and uh, arrest a bunch of people, use the National Guard to arrest a bunch of people, press A. And if you think that that's just a crazy, uh, a crazy LARP, total imagination, uh, Biden's going to be the president. There's not going to be any inaugural fuss. Press F. Okay. No, just... Yeah, you know, it's, this is not a hundred percent. This is just which are you leaning towards? A or F? Not not about what you want. I'm just asking what you think. And don't worry. It's not about you. It's not. I hope I'm wrong and that sort of stuff. Yeah, so it looks like it's about 60-40 for the A's. 
So, um, <laughs> that's funny. That's fine. I'm just curious, you know, the, when you, when you have these streams and, you know, the, the shills come on, the, the reason I like to do this sort of thing is because the shills come on and they make uh, these negative statements uh, as much as possible. And, you know, they try to make it, they, they try to mislead everyone. But this, we can actually see how, you know, what the, what the actual, uh, what the actual numbers are. What branch of the military is most likely to be loyal to the president? The Space Force. <laughs> now ban all the Fs. No, that's not the point. Anyhow, it's fine. I just, like I said, I just wanted to get a, um, I just wanted to get a, a rough idea and um, see what people were thinking. So uh, go ahead and continue with the Super Chats. But first, uh, I think we're going to uh, fire up uh, since we since we talked about uh, Arcaven's new partnership with Super Prumo, I, uh, and we've got some people here who weren't here last night, let's uh, show you this again, okay? So I'm going to turn this on. So that is the little trailer that uh, Luciano and the Super Tr Prumo team put together to introduce our new partnership, uh, Arcave and Comics. Uh, we are going to be publishing their great Brazilian comics, The Awakener, Hecatoom, uh, The Grey Claw, Lieutenant Bravo, Jungle Sword. Um, we're going to be publishing those in English, and they're going to be uh, publishing our Arcaven comics in Brazilian Portuguese, possibly Spanish at some point. Actually, I think we're just planning for Portuguese now that I think about it. Um, the sniper is the Super Prumo character, The Awakener. Paul Greenleaf asks, how much did the Middle East peace deals cha charge Trump's power in the world? Uh, probably more than people think. Um, he really made some major changes uh, with Saudi Arabia vis-a-vis um, -vis the whole Iranian situation. And the impressive thing is that he did it without war. And that's the most impressive thing about Trump is the way that he manages to succeed without breaking things. Let's see. Um, who is doing the translation? Uh, well, they're they're doing all the translations, both into English and into Portuguese. And the legend Chuck Dixon is going to be touching up the the dialogue and stuff. So it's going to be awesome. Uh, the trailer's linked. It's 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 on this channel. Federal prisons were put on lockdown today. Yes, that's part of it. I, I think that's definitely related. You know, the more 
the more you see these things, the more pieces of the puzzle fall into place, the more obvious it all becomes. We don't have an, a downloadable app yet for the comics. We will eventually. Rhino Bear says, I predict a future Sabaton song. <laughs> I like the one about Poland, 1944. Um, Bear Koch says, I may not have all the answers, but God does no matter what happens. It is well with my soul. Excellent. Uh, Will you ever be able to do glass bead game? I believe we will eventually. Um, it's going to take us some time to acquire the rights and stuff, but that's that's what I want to do. So, okay, good. Well, um, thanks very much. Yeah, but and by the way, I, I wanted somebody mentioned this, and I forgot to mention that too. Again, don't assume observe when the military says it's not holding a farewell ceremony for Trump the Occam's razor suggests it's because they're not saying farewell to Trump keep that in mind one last question Ukrainian bear hey box do arbitration laws vary by state yes definitely if so would the tech companies attend an exodus from California to find laws that cater in their favor uh, well, they'd like to, and Delaware is probably best for them, but uh, they don't want to move to Delaware. 